next month, November 12th, second Sunday night of the month, we will meet. We are not going to start a new book of the Bible to study, but we are going to have a testimony night, and we're going to have a couple ladies share what God has been doing in their lives to encourage us. Um, and I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet, but come. It'll be interesting. <laughs> okay. I think that's it for announcements. So let's pray and we will get right into chapter 5. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you for the truth that it teaches us. We thank you for your promises and just for who you are. And we just ask that you would come, you would speak to us tonight through your word. I pray that our time of fellowship and praying for one another would be sweet and pleasing to you also. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. <clears throat> okay, so 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son? So I think it was back in the first chapter that we talked about this idea that throughout this book, John lays out three tests for us to examine ourselves and to see if we truly are followers of Jesus. We had the truth test or you might want to call it the faith test. But right here in verse 1, he says, who believes that Jesus is the Christ. And we saw this back in chapter 1 of 1 John in the very beginning when he wrote that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. So this idea of truth, do we believe correctly that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is equal to God the Father, that he was with him from the beginning? Uh, he took part in creation. Everything was created by him and through him. And then the second test that John gives us is the love test. And if you've noticed, as we've gone through this book, that is the one topic that just keeps getting brought up over and over and over. And here in chapter 5, he says, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Those born of him are believers. So we love God and we love our Christian brothers and sisters. And we saw this in chapter 4 of this book, in verse 20 and 21, where he says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen, and this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then the third test, Guzik calls it the moral test. I'd like to call it the obedience test. But he says here in verse 3 that we keep his commandments. And if we look back in chapter 2, Beginning in verse 3, he told us, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, 
In him, truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. And then again in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, we read, No one who abides in him, meaning God, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And then verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so we have these three tests laid out, and John repeats it over and over and over. If we are truly followers of Jesus, then we believe, we love, and we obey. And this term, born of God, uh, we discussed how, do I keep hitting something? What? Yeah. Okay. So this phrase, born of God, that he keeps talking about. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, we have this interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus, where Jesus tells him a person must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. So all throughout this book, when he talks about those who are born of God, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about people who have been born again. Um, our old self dies, we become a brand new creation in Christ. And what I think is kind of interesting um, in John chapter 3 is after he goes through this whole dialogue with Nicodemus, in verse 36, we read, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, when I first read it, I thought, okay, well, that's not right. Like you expect it to say, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But it doesn't say that. It says obey. So belief and obedience go hand in hand. That's, that's the sign or the trait that you truly believe and you're truly a follower of Jesus. Now back in 1 John, and I'm going to belabor this point. This is, this is the last time we're going to circle through these three tests. But in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, he says, And this is his commandment. So when we read that if we keep his commandments, we are truly children of God and not children of the devil. In verse 23, he says, This is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, so that's our truth or faith test, and love one another just as he commanded us, our love test. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. So that's the obedience test, that we obey his commandments. Now, back in chapter 5, verse 4, we have this wording about overcoming and victory. And the word overcome has the idea that we are in a battle or we are in a fight. Um, there's something that we need to overcome or conquer. And our weapon is faith. That's how we win. That's how we get the victory according to this verse. But what I, what I find is interesting about this verse is the tense. Because it says, this is the victory that has overcome the world. Past tense. Jesus has already won the battle for us. The end of the story has already been written. It's a, it's a done deal that we are on the winning side. And my husband has been going through Hebrews and talking a lot about faith. 
And so I'm not going to talk a lot about it because he actually touched on a couple things today that are in my notes, but here we go. So Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then in Ephesians, we find out that the faith that we need to please him is actually a gift from God. So it's not something that I have to like work up in me, but it's actually a gift that he gives me so that I have the ability to believe him. I have the ability to trust him. I don't know how many of you used to read books by Beth Moore or heard her speak, but she had this saying, which I just thought was kind of cool and it kind of ties in with this area. She said, God is who he says he is. God can do what he says he can do. I am who God says I am. I can do all things through Christ. God's word is alive and active in me. So what I think is cool about that is God is who he says he is, not who we think he is or what we want him to be or what the world says he is, but he is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. I would like to change that word to he does what he says he's going to do. He keeps his promises. If he says he's going to do something, you can take it to the bank. It is 100% guaranteed that it is going to happen. And then this section of it, we could probably do a whole teaching on, I am who God says I am. I am not who other people say I am, whether it's family, friends, the world, I don't know, your coworkers, other people, um, but you are who God says you are. And frankly, he's the only opinion that matters. And then I can do all things through Christ. And we know this, that in his strength, any job or any task that he gives us to do, he equips us. He gives us the ability to actually do it. And then God's word is alive and active in me. Well, the only way that can be true is if we are actually in his word if we are reading his word, if we are meditating and memorizing his word so it's in our heart, then it can be alive and active in us. So that's just a little rabbit trail I took us down on. Okay, so moving on to verse 6. This next section, verse 6 through 12, is very difficult to understand. And when you study it and you read different commentaries, there are multiple opinions about what he is talking about. I'm not smart enough to tell you <laughs> um, which one is the one you should believe, so I'm going to give you the three, I guess, most popular um, thoughts on what John is talking about here. So beginning in verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So some of you, do any of you have the King James or the New King James Version? Okay, so I left out a verse, and I'm going to read to you why. Um, don't normally 
do this, but <clears throat> there's a textual problem here in the New King James or the King James Version where he talks about the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And what's interesting is this phrase, beginning with in heaven, through on earth, are not part of John's original letter and shouldn't be there. There are no Greek manuscripts with this additional phrase before the 15th century. It comes from a marginal comment that was found in one text of an old Latin manuscript. Okay, so most theologians and biblical scholars agree that that should not be in the Bible. It is between seven and eight. What version do you have? Okay. What? The phrase from in heaven, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, through on earth. Okay, but you have, which version of the Bible do you have? Okay, so they took it out. That's good. But you have it. Okay, good. Well, some of you have it, some of you don't. I'm just... Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we know who the Spirit is. That's the Holy Spirit. Hopefully in your Bibles, whatever version you have, the Spirit is a capital S because it's referring to the Holy Spirit. But what is he talking about with the water and the blood? Here are your three options. Number one, the water is his physical birth when he was born of Mary because when we are born, we come out in water. We are surrounded by amniotic fluid, the water of his birth. His blood would be the death on the cross where his blood was poured out for the remission of sins. So that's one belief. Another one is the water refers to his baptism when he began his earthly ministry and the blood, his death on the cross when he ended his earthly ministry. And then the third one is if you remember when they crucified people, you could stay alive for a long time hanging on a cross because you could push yourself up to get breath. So when they were really done with you, they would break your leg so you couldn't do that and you would suffocate. But if you remember, they didn't do this to Jesus. When they came to him, the soldier took his spear and pierced him in the side and we read that water and blood flowed out. So it could also be talking about that. I don't know that we have to like dogmatically say it's which one of these it is, but those are the options that are out there. But looking at verse 9, he talks about if we receive the testimony of men. Okay, John gives us the testimony of men because he talks about in the beginning of this book, the disciples, they interacted with Jesus through their senses. So they saw him with their own eyes. They heard him speak with their own ears. They touched him with their own hands. So that is the testimony of men, eyewitness testimony. But then we also have the testimony of God, and that is greater. Back in John chapter 3, where we have the back and forth between Jesus and Nicodemus, in verse 11, in the middle of this conversation, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Notice the pronouns that Jesus uses there. They are plural. It's we and our. Uh, he's talking about the Trinity. And one of the times in the Bible that we see this uh, perfectly demonstrated is at his baptism, where you have God the Father's voice that says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Then you have the Holy Spirit descend on him in the form of a dove. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit um, all there in that one 
one seen in the Bible giving testimony that Jesus is who he says he is, okay? All right. So now we're going to move on to a little bit easier to understand section, verse 13 through 15. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So here we have one of the reasons that John wrote this book. That those of us who are saved would know, we would know that we know that we know that we have eternal life. We have this assurance of salvation, the hope of heaven. And then we're in this relationship with God that gives us confidence that we can come to him and we can ask him things. As we abide in him and we know him more and more, his desires become our desires and we want what he wants. And so it's natural that we would pray his will. So some people take some of these verses that talk about, you know, if you ask, you receive, and they use that for their um, prosperity doctrine. Um, but if we read it, that's not what it says. It's not like a blank check. You ask him whatever you want, and he's the big Santa Claus in the sky that just gives you whatever you want. But it specifically says, if we ask according to his will, that's the important part that some denominations leave out. But that's the idea, that we have this relationship with him, that we want what he wants, and he puts his desires in our hearts, so we pray his will. Verse 16. Okay, for whatever reason, and I didn't realize this when I decided that we were going to study this book, is 1 John chapter 5 has two of the most difficult sections of scripture to understand. <laughs> so we've already been through the water and the blood section. Now we have another one here in verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Everybody get it? Everybody understand? <laughs> okay, so this, these are a couple very hard verses. But first off, we see that if our sister or our brother is sinning, then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to judge them. We're supposed to ridicule them, gossip about them. No, we're supposed to pray for them first and then help or aid in their restoration. <clears throat> if you see your sister falling into a pit, then your job as her sister is you reach down and you help pull her out. Okay, that's, that's the idea that we are supposed to be not only encouraging and exhorting one another, but when we see someone taking the wrong path, going down the wrong way, because we love them, we draw attention to it. And we say, hey, you need to stop. You need to stop going down that way. But this sin that leads to death, what is he talking about? All sin leads to death. All sin leads to physical death and spiritual death because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And because of Adam and Eve's sin, death entered into this world. Jesus paid for the sins of the world. And if a person believes and confesses and repents and <clears throat> submits to his lordship, then his sins are forgiven and he escapes spiritual death, okay? <clears throat> so most theologians say that this section is talking about the unforgivable sin. 
some traditions try to take sins and we put them in different categories. You know, the big sins. Um, I know in Catholicism there are sins that, like, they directly put you in hell. Like, you can't go to purgatory or you can't, all these different things. Um, and what's interesting is with God, sin is sin. So it really doesn't matter if it's a big sin or a little sin, it's still sin. But the unforgivable sin is when someone rejects Jesus. Now, I can't tell um, from your outward appearance if you have rejected Jesus. I can't read your mind. I don't know your heart. And I'm actually not in a position to judge your heart. Only God can. And so, if you have someone that you love that is not living for Jesus, I would encourage you to pray for them and keep praying for them until they take their last breath. Because we're not going to know for sure if they have committed the unforgivable sin until they are in that position. Because up until then, there is hope and they can repent and they can um, make their relationship right with Jesus. And so, to be perfectly honest, I don't understand why he would say this. Um, one thing that commentators wrote was, he's not forbidding people to pray for those people. He's just saying you don't have to. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, I think maybe you should. <laughs> Especially if you love them. Okay. So then we move on to verse 18 through 20. And we have a couple of these we know. And that's what this whole book is about. That John wrote this book so that we would know things. So beginning in verse 18, he says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. So what's interesting here is the Greek word that they translate touch means to attach oneself to or to cling onto. It's the same word used when Jesus told Mary to stop clinging to him after he appeared to her after his resurrection. And so John is saying the evil one, the devil, and his demons cannot grasp a hold of you. They can't attach themselves to you if you are born of God. If you are not a child of God, then you don't have this promise or this protection. You are fair game. And so I've had some conversations lately about what the devil can and cannot do or to what extent he can harass us or influence, influence us. And so I'm just going to take a very quick rabbit trail here to look at what the Bible says about this. So first, we know that a believer cannot be possessed or controlled by demons. And we know this from 1 John chapter 1, because darkness and light do not exist in the same place. Once a person is born again, once you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And the Holy Spirit does not make room for another spirit to come on in. It's not like, you know, he doesn't slide over to say, oh yeah, you can come in too. That's not how it works. Secondly, the evil one has to ask permission to do anything to a child of God, to a believer. We see two examples of this in the Bible, with Job and with Peter. And with Job, we read, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has 
on every side. Okay, so we know this story. Uh, from the wording here, Satan had already looked at Job and had already tried to harass him or influence him. But he couldn't because God had set a hedge of protection around him and everything he owned, all his possessions. So we have Satan who has to come with his tail between his legs. I like that. Just thinking of like the pitchfork and whatever. I thought it was funny. And ask God permission to attack Job. And he could only touch what God allowed him to touch in that situation. Satan did not have free reign. Remember, he had to keep coming back to ask for more and more. Because he doesn't get free reign over the children of God. And then the interaction between Peter and Jesus, when Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So again, we have Satan here who asks or demands that God turn over Peter. But God's answer was no, you can't have him because he belongs to me. And I like the finality of Jesus' words that I have prayed for you and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Like it was a done deal. This is what was going to happen. The answer to Satan was going to be no, you can't have Peter. So nothing happens to us without going through our heavenly father first. And then third, I think this fascination <clears throat> with evil is unhealthy and it puts our focus on the wrong thing or the wrong area. When Jesus taught us to pray, specifically his disciples to pray, the last line in the prayer is deliver us from evil. Some translations say deliver us from the evil one, okay? So that's directed to God. You pray to God that he would protect you, that he would put a hedge of protection around you and your family. You don't talk to Satan or demons or whoever else. In James 4, we read, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And usually we focus on the resist the devil, resist the devil, resist the devil. But the first part of that is submit yourself to God. So what you need to do if you feel like you've been being harassed by evil is are you fully surrendered and submitted to God in every area of your life? That's number one. <clears throat> in Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. But the verse before that says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And so there's always this focus in the Bible of <clears throat> not necessarily interacting with evil or whoever, whomever you think is harassing you, but it's always about our relationship to God. We pray to God. We submit ourselves to God. We stand strong in the strength of God. And we put on the armor of God so that he can, so we can stand. And so Satan can't attach himself to us. He can't grasp a hold of us. Maybe he can stand, I don't know, six feet away, like with COVID. You got to give me six feet and shoot fiery darts at me. But even that goes through God. He doesn't just get fair game with God's children. That's not how it works. <clears throat> Verse 19. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But we don't. We are not under the power of Satan. He does not have control over us. Because at one time, we did. At one time, before you were saved, you lived in his kingdom. And he had you right where he wanted you. And you did live under his power and under his influence and his control. 
but not anymore because now God has taken you out of that kingdom and placed you in his kingdom of glorious light. And then verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So the Holy Spirit gives us understanding so that we can know the truth. So the world sins. The evil one can attach himself to them. He can cling to them, hold on to them. The world is under his power and his influence. The world is deceived by him and cannot understand the truth unless God opens their eyes. You and I were once part of this kingdom of darkness, but then the imagery in Ephesians is actually God swooping in and grabbing you and taking you out of one kingdom and bringing you into another. Ephesians chapter 2, um, I'm just going to read a couple verses because I know I've gone long again. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And who is that? Satan. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So when you were in Satan's kingdom, you cared about yourself and you cared about satisfying your own pleasures, the lust of the flesh. You were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So that is your reality because you are a child of God. Okay, last verse. And I think it's kind of funny in a way that John ends this book with this short little verse, verse 21. He says, little children, keep yourself from idols. We know that an idol is anyone or anything that we love more than God that we pursue, that has our heart, our attention. Elizabeth Elliot um, has a quote that I think sums it up <clears throat> really good about this. And she says, when obedience to God contradicts what I think will give me pleasure, let me ask myself if I love him. And I thought that was a good way to end this book that when obedience to God contradicts what I think I want, I have to ask myself, do I love him? Do I truly love him? Or do I love something or someone else more than him? So application. We know the reason John wrote this book was that so we would know that we would have assurance of salvation, that we would not sin, and that our joy would be complete. He also wrote it that we would pass those three tests, the truth test, the love test, the obedience test. So we need to examine ourselves to make sure we pass them, to make sure we have confidence in our relationship with God. Um, and if we don't, then we need to spend some time with him figuring that out. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for your promises. Thank you that you are greater than anyone or anything else. We thank you that you love us and that you care about us and that you protect us. And we pray that our time now in, in our small groups and our 
discussion time would just be sweet to you, it would be pleasing to you, and it would be encouraging to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so your cards that you got.